uh, the analysts may look this into meeting is being recorded. The analysts may look into document specific uh, uh, domain specific documentation or legacy systems. Um, and of course, also uh, the analysts will engage in many conversations with the stakeholder. And uh, as a result of uh, uh, a consolidation process of the elicitation inputs, uh, the analyst comes up with the specification. Uh, this specification, sorry, this elicitation process that leads to the specification is heavily centered on conversational activities. If you look at the results uh, of the NAPIRE survey, uh, I took this picture from their website, we can see that among the most uh, popular uh, elicitation techniques, uh, uh, some of the very top, actually the top one used almost by 70% of the interviewees of the respondents uh, are interviews, which are conversations. Uh, at the third place, we have uh, workshops and focus groups, uh, which are also conversations. We may even argue that prototyping has a conversational aspect because sure, you have to build your prototype, uh, but then you want to demonstrate the prototype and usually that provides you uh, with additional feedback. So I think uh, it, is, uh, it is pretty established that conversations are, um, are a very important and very prevalent part of RE in practice. Yet the research on conversations is uh, a bit lesser. So why should we research conversations right now? Well, probably for the very same reason uh, why we are having this conference online today, uh, talking by a Zoom. Um, one of the very few probably uh, positive effects of the COVID-19 pandemic is that we learned uh, that we can uh, uh, work more remotely and collaborate remotely. And that also means that uh, we can uh, conduct requirements, uh, requirement solicitation sessions online. And that is already taking place. I'm, uh, in col I'm collaborating with several uh, industries and they're doing that more and more often. And as a side note uh, to that, uh, these conversations can not only be recorded, but uh, lately you can also automatically transcribe them. And you can see that happening uh, on the fly in these captions that I activated uh, for some of the audience. Um, so I think it's really timely now to do this research because we have the possibility to, um, to get access to transcripts of the interviews, which is something that we didn't have access to until a few years ago. Okay, so let's get into uh, what I mean by conversational RE. Uh, but before getting there, I'd like to take a step back and uh, I'd like to talk about the refinement in requirements engineering. And uh, my slides go back to 1994 when uh, Klaus Paul proposed uh, this highly influential uh, uh, cube uh, that represents the three perspective or three dimensions of requirements engineering. And what it shows is that RE, according to, Plo, uh, according to Klaus Paul, is about moving from an initial RE input, which is informally expressed. Uh, it represents the personal view, usually of one stakeholder. And in terms of specification completeness, it is opaque or very incomplete. Um, and then what you want to do is to do a refinement of the requirements uh, according to the degree of specification, uh, agreement, and representation, where you reach the result of having a desired RE output that is formal, that is complete, and that represents a common view uh, between the stakeholders. And what you see in practice is actually that the refinement path is not really a straight line. It is uh, more a, a tortuous road and uh, uh, you hardly reach the desired output um, and you have many deviations along the way. And uh, I think that is also why we do so much research in RE uh, to try to have a path of refinement that is a bit more straight. And uh, part of uh, the 
techniques that we propose are NLP for RE tools. And these tools uh, can support this refinement process. But how do they do that? Um, this is my own conceptualization of how the tools we've built uh, up to today generally work. Um, there is, of course, a dissertation, and uh, the analyst then consolidates the inputs into a specification. And then we have our NLP for RD tools. And what they do is they support uh, the refinement process by taking this specification and by highlighting uh, certain aspects or transforming the specification into models. Um, here in these uh, very simple examples, uh, the tool is highlighting a vague word uh, and then it's uh, highlighting a referential ambiguity. So what you can see here is uh, that the tools operate uh, on uh, this consolidated output uh, that starts from the recitation, but is created by the analyst. And uh, what I'd like to convey in this uh, keynote is uh, a picture uh, that is slightly different. So in my view, NLP for RE tools for conversational RE um, look like this. So they support the um, side by side, uh, they, they, they support the conversation between the analyst and the stakeholder. So rather than operating on the consolidated output, the specification, they, uh, they work on the conversation itself. And by doing that, uh, we also uh, have a side effect, which is specific, uh, sorry, elicitation and requirements become concurrent activities that go hand in hand. And I think that's also more in line with co-design and the collaborative uh, prototyping, these practices, practices that you see a lot in, um, in the industry these days. I'm now taking the words of my PhD student, uh, Cherk uh, Spikeman, uh, and uh, uh, based on this intuition, we can define conversational RE as the, uh, between brackets, automated analysis of requirement solicitation conversations with the goal of identifying and extracting requirements relevant information. So I think the key aspects over here are really that we focus on conversations and not on uh, specifications and that we want to find information that may be relevant for requirements analysts. Let me try to convince you a bit more about uh, uh, why I think uh, conversations are very interesting artifacts. Um, on the left, you can see uh, a simple transcript uh, of um, uh, 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 a basic conversation between an analyst A and uh, a uh, stakeholder S. And uh, uh, what you can see, first of all, and now try to compare that with specifications, is that we have text uh, that comes from two or more parties. Um, in practical settings that we analyzed, uh, we sometimes have four, six, uh, seven people talking. Um, compare that to a specification where you have a, a consolidated view written by from the perspective of the analysts only. Secondly, the conversation is informal. You will not find shall statements. People are not talking according to user stories. Uh, the people in a conversation don't use a glossary. Third, the, the relevant information may be sparse. So there is no uh, uh, delimited section where people talk about, for instance, security requirements. Uh, people may start talking about that in the beginning and then have a break, talk about some other topic and then get back to that. So uh, they may also talk about the weather. Uh, they may talk about project management issues. Uh, a conversation is harder to constrain. And finally, uh, but importantly, conversations are social activities. So you may have a... Uh, uh, persuasions. You may have uh, the analyst trying to, uh, to, to persuade the stakeholders that the best way to solve the problem is the way that they have in their standard software product. You may have moments of uncertainty, for example, over here, where the stakeholder says something like, let me think, and that's a cue, right, that maybe there is no clarity there. 
there may be misunderstandings that don't get resolved. So I think in general, you may, I hope you agree with me that uh, conversations are rather interesting artifacts to look at. We can also look at conversations under the lenses of uh, frameworks uh, from uh, computational linguistics. Um, here I'm referring to one of them. Uh, it's by no means the only one, but I find uh, this uh, framework by uh, Traum and uh, Hinkelmann a nice one uh, to show how uh, a conversation can be dissected in different layers. Um, a very basic layer is that of speaker terms. So uh, the analyst speaks, then uh, the stakeholder speaks, then you go back to the analyst, right? And within a speaker term, uh, the same speaker may have more than one utterance unit. Um, so for example, you may have two questions or, well, if you look at this uh, uh, keynote, uh, I'm making actually many, many utterance units before I let you speak. And the meaning uh, of, uh, or the effect, sorry, of an utterance unit on the conversation is what is called, uh, at least in this framework, grounding X. So some utterance units have the effect of initiating the conversation. Some uh, serve to acknowledge, for instance, that the other party has understood that it's their turn now, um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, when we look at these layers, we can now raise uh, the layer and uh, we can go from grounding X uh, to, for instance, discourse units, which actually focus on cross-speaker interaction that defines the meaning. For instance, these uh, three utterances that uh, spread across uh, two different speaker terms uh, include um, a discourse unit uh, with um, a WH question followed uh, by a check. And we may go even farther up. Again, I'm not convincing, I don't want to convince you about this specific framework. I'm trying to show you how many layers exist in a conversation. And that the uppermost layer, at least in the conversation X framework, is that of argumentation. And argumentation actually is about the purpose of a conversation across multiple terms. And uh, examples of that are the basic QA. Um, but you may also have clarification, summary, persuasion, and you can see that these argumentation acts actually um, have an overlap. They are not uh, distinct from each other. So I think when we compare a conversation with a specification, we should uh, see that they are not quite the same. And if we think of how AI uh, for our tools or NLP for our tools uh, operate, uh, you may already start imagining that it's slightly different to operate on this complex artifact uh, that is informal, has so many layers and so on, compared to uh, operating on a specification, which is a bit more disciplined, uh, if, you will, if you wish. OK, let me try to um, uh, reify my uh, vision with uh, two examples of prototype tools that we are building in the lab. Uh, the first one does traceability. The second one does uh, summarization. Let's get started with uh, trace to conv which is uh, a tool that will actually be presented uh, tomorrow as well in the Arenex paper by uh, Chair Spikeman. So please make sure to attend that session too. Um, trace to conv um, we have seen already this idea that uh, the inputs collected uh, via elicitation are consolidated by an analyst uh, into a specification document. And what TraceToConf does is it tries to take uh, the contents of the specification and uh, trace them back uh, to the conversations. So looking at the tool in terms of uh, traceability research, it supports uh, backward traceability because we go back and pre-requirement specification because we are looking at uh, the artifacts, in this case, the, specific, uh, the conversations that um, uh, originate the requirements. And this is an area of research that is uh, largely overlooked, unfortunately, and mostly because, in my opinion, there are no artifacts available. And what is the goal? The goal of trace to comp is to provide additional context to a requirement. 
So this is a subtle distinction. We are not looking, uh, well, sometimes we are, but uh, it is difficult to expect you will be finding exactly that requirement specified in the interview. It is much more likely to expect uh, that we can find the reasons why that requirement is in place. Or we may find, uh, for instance, an explanation of the terms using the requirement or anything along those lines. Um, the challenge for trace to come is that of coping uh, with an abstraction gap, because it tries to go from an inherently formal artifact, which is the specification, to something that is informal, so the conversations. So that means that um, classic traceability techniques are probably difficult to use. And in fact, we are for, for now we are using pretty simple NLP techniques, uh, uh, although in the future we will see what we can do. Um, so what are the use cases of trace to conv? As I said, uh, uh, the main idea is we want to trace requirements back to elicitation sessions. And by doing that, we may enable different uh, uh, use cases such as obtaining client agreement. For instance, the client may uh, be unsure about a certain requirement. And if you are able to pinpoint what parts of the conversation we're referring to that requirement, uh, you can explain uh, to the client uh, that you just didn't invent the requirement, but that was actually discussed. And imagine that real world projects uh, include multiple conversation sessions with multiple stakeholders. So it may, uh, it is uh, typical that one specific stakeholder doesn't know all of the requirements. Um, Trace2Conv also allows iterative specification writing and review. For instance, while you write the, the specification, you may look back into the conversation and identify requirements you had missed uh, or maybe that you had misunderstood and you may refine those uh, requirements. And thirdly, trace to can be used, uh, uh, can be useful also for developers when they develop the requirement. And uh, uh, it may provide extra context that is not in the specification. So maybe they read the requirement, but they don't know exactly what is meant by this or that term. And then they can look back into the conversation and get a better understanding. Um, I'm going to show to you very briefly about how this works and then give you a demo. Um, so um, in trace to conv um, we have first a uh, uh, pre-processing and data matching um, um, uh, module where we take a collection of user stories or other requirements as well. And then we take a transcript of a conversation that includes a start time and end time um, uh, for each speaker turn. Then we know who is the speaker and then we have the text that was actually uttered. And uh, uh, the idea is that we want to trace uh, user stories to the speaker terms. And to do that, we use, uh, for now, pretty basic uh, techniques from NLP. Uh, let me illustrate to you how this works with, a, uh, with an example. So we have a user story here. As a vendor user, I can use the password forgotten functionality whenever blah, blah, blah. And uh, uh, what our tool does is it applies uh, standard processing techniques such as tokenization, lemmatization, and uh, uh, part of speech tagging. And uh, then what it does is we retain uh, only certain elements. We retain nouns and verbs, uh, and then we exclude the uh, auxiliary verbs. And by doing that, uh, we retain only part of one requirement. So a requirement is characterized uh, only by certain words. For instance, this requirement is characterized by vendor, by user, by password, and so on. We do the same process both for the requirements and for the speaker terms. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then what the tool does, it does a matching. So we uh, link uh, uh, requirements to those speaker terms uh, that have shared uh, uh, terms. And by doing that, uh, what we enable is um, essentially linking this requirement uh, to a number of speaker terms that, for example, include the word vendor that, uh, that was uh, uh, included here in the requirement. Let me now 
actually get to the front end to show to you a little bit about how trace to conv uh, works. I prepared a recorded demo to avoid uh, uh, big problems. OK, so this is the, um, the basic page of uh, trace to conv where you can explore different uh, transcripts. What we can see is that we have two modalities. We can explore the speaker turns down here, or uh, we can explore the requirements. If you look at the speaker turns, we get essentially the transcript of the conversation. And we can filter it by a keyword if we want to see only those speaker turns that pertain to a certain topic, for example. But the more interesting part is that about requirements. So here we have a list of requirements we imported from an Excel spreadsheet. And uh, we will now focus on one of them. And what you can see in trace to com is um, a list uh, of uh, tokens uh, that have been processed and they occur in that requirement. For example, the token uh, sense occurs actually in 27 different speaker terms. You see that email occurs in that requirement, but in no speaker term. Vendor is actually very common in this conversation. And you can also see in how many requirements the, the token occurs. Let's look at sense. The basic zoom in we have is we can see all the speaker turns that have direct matches. Of course, that uses lemmatization. So for instance, sent or send or sense are all matched. Uh, but in addition to that uh, exploration mechanism, we have a second one, which is synonym matches. Uh, we are using different libraries. Uh, now um, I'm showing to you just uh, one example. So for instance, we identify that email or mail is a synonym, and that allows you to get a bigger picture that includes not only the speaker terms with sent, but also those with mail or email. Let us now get back to our requirement and let's try to explore a different token. And the one we pick is, for example, create. And uh, in this specific case, what we see is we find that the first direct match is almost an exact rewarding of the requirement. So one may want actually to view now the transcript. And why would you want to do it? Uh, because you want to have the context where that speaker, where that word was mentioned. So you can understand better why that requirement is in place. So if we go back uh, to the requirement view, uh, we have two scoring mechanisms that focus on the combination of the different tokens. The first one counts, uh, uh, looks at uh, speaker terms where the same token occurs multiple times. For instance, in this one, person occurs twice, one as people, one as person. And then we have a scoring uh, where there are multiple tokens in the same speaker term. So there is high likelihood that that speaker term is relevant. For instance, in the speaker term, we have the word link that was in the requirement as well, password, which also was in the requirement. Um, uh, we have the word vendor, also in the requirement, and email as well. So there is a high likelihood uh, that this is a relevant um, uh, speaker term uh, for that requirement. So you can see, I think, from this demo that uh, what uh, Tracer.conv uh, allows you to do is uh, it supports the interactive exploration of uh, pre-requirement specification artifacts and in particular of a conversation. It doesn't automate everything for you, but it is an advanced uh, search uh, functionality. Uh, where are we heading to with trace to conf uh, So of course, we're looking for better heuristics because we would like to make sure that the speaker terms that we identify are highly relevant ones. Secondly, we are trying to understand uh, uh, what should be the unit of matching, because for now we are uh, relating uh, uh, requirements to speaker terms. But if you recall this uh, image that I've shown to you about conversation X, uh, there are other types of units, uh, for example, uh, that, that, that um, encompass more than one speaker term. Um, and then we are also looking at uh, doing some qualitative studies to try to understand the evolution of requirements and whether we can follow that uh, by looking at different conversations for the same project.
Okay, let's get to a second uh, example, uh, which is called the requirements conversation summarizer. Now the credit goes mostly to uh, Xavier, who defended uh, his uh, master thesis uh, yesterday, actually. Um, and uh, uh, this tool uh, focuses on uh, doing a summarization of a conversation before a specification exists. Trace to comp assumes we already have requirements. In this case, we don't. And the research trigger has been uh, that uh, we explored the very long conversations. Sometimes we had some that lasted six or eight hours. And it was very difficult to find the relevant uh, material in that conversation. Uh, so we thought, how can we facilitate uh, uh, an analyst in exploring the transcript um, when a when specification is not there. And uh, the, uh, this tool uh, builds on uh, three main ideas or assumptions. The first one is that we should be able to identify the questions. Keep in mind that a conversation is a Q&A uh, interaction generally. And of course, the assumption is that uh, we are able to do that uh, without having uh, uh, clear signals such as question marks. The second idea is that we should be able to objectively filter questions by relevance. So some should be relevant for RE and some shouldn't be. And the third idea is that we should also be able to label uh, the questions in terms of why they are relevant. This is still a work in progress, so I will not talk about that today but I think you get the idea of what we want to do. Okay, so the first idea is, all right, we have a transcript and we want to mark questions in the transcript. And uh, uh, to do that, we experimented with two techniques from the literature. The first one is based on sequences of uh, part of speech text, which allow to identify three types of uh, questions. Uh, without much intelligence because just part of speech tagging. And the second approach is using a pre-trained uh, deep learning uh, library um, that uh, uh, focuses on speech X. So they train this on a whole bunch of conversations of different types. They have 30, 38 types of uh, questions out of which 28 uh, were actually occurring uh, in the transcripts that we used uh, from real world interviews. And then we experimented also with a combination, a simple heuristic where we say, hey, this is a question, sorry, not a relevant one, just a question if either of the approaches says so. Is idea number one effective? Well, let's look uh, very briefly at uh, the standard metrics of precision and recall and F1 score. Uh, what we can see is that the approach based on deep learning is quite more effective than, than the one based on part of speech text, because we can achieve a precision of over 80% and a recall of 91%. When we combine the two techniques uh, with this either or, uh, of course, we increase the recall, uh, but we have, uh, uh, we decrease the precision. But I think in general, it seems to, to be the case that if we, all we want to do is to identify the questions, uh, existing NLP works all right. But the second idea, which is more interesting, is how do we filter the relevant questions? Not all the questions are probably relevant for the requirements engineer. So if we ask, how are you today? Probably you don't care about that. And to do this filtering, we take the input from the previous step. And then uh, uh, what uh, we want to do is to do the, this uh, uh, filtering. So we classify some as relevant. And to do that, we use two variants of TF, IDF. So the general idea is that we want to distinguish, or the assumption is that we can distinguish relevance depending on whether a question includes domain-specific words uh, that occur more frequently in our context than in a general purpose corpus such as Wikipedia. So when we calculate TF-IDF, um, in this approach, we use two different uh, techniques. In the first one, we calculate uh, term frequency on Wikipedia and inverse document frequency on the transcription itself. 
in the second case, uh, to calculate uh, inverse document frequency, we take uh, a context document, which can be a system or a project definition document, which is something that you generally have in a real uh, world setting when you start a project. So we wanted to experiment with these two different ways of identifying relevance. But what is our gold standard? So, of course, the question is, all right, so how do you measure effectiveness? Uh, there is a lengthy discussion about that. But uh, for now, what we have, what we gave human taggers is um, uh, a sequence of speaker terms. So the central one is the one where there is a question, which is shown uh, in a bold. We show the next speaker term, which is likely to include an answer that is relevant. And then to give more context, we show this, the previous speaker term. And uh, uh, then we ask uh, the tigers to tell us what type of requirements relevant information can be found. And we have a few categories, functional requirements, uh, uh, non-functionals, uh, a description of the current process, uh, system users, uh, so stakeholder identification, scoping decisions, and so on. And then, well, very importantly, we also ask where is the requirements relevant information? And uh, uh, this is very tricky actually, because when uh, they can choose whether the question in the current speaker term uh, is likely to be answered with uh, requirements relevant information or whether the next speaker term, so the answer essentially, contains requirements relevant information. And of course, they can pick both. This is subject to a lot of discussion, but based on the uh, golden standard we built, uh, we uh, obtained some results. And uh, of course, if you look at the results uh, about idea, the second idea about the relevance, we have to look it in context with the first idea where we have the, these three ideas of uh, speech X, uh, part of speech text, and a combined version. And then if we compare the two different ways of uh, calculating IDF, so the context document or the conversation, what we see is that they are practically equivalent in, in the three settings. So over here, uh, if we split like this, we see similar results. So the bigger effect actually comes from the way we identify the questions, but we didn't see big differences uh, for now. So where are we heading to with this second tool? Um, as I already stated, there is large disagreement about what relevance means. So for now, we thought it's possible to define the relevance of uh, an answer or a question in absolute terms, but we are considering whether we should uh, focus on specific tasks. So depending on the context at hand, uh, you may say this is relevant or this is irrelevant. And secondly, uh, we should also study how much we can summarize. In the end, the goal of the second tool is to assist uh, in a more efficient exploration. And that means we need to be able to get rid of some of the content. And some preliminary uh, results over here show that if you show all the questions uh, on average, uh, we show 32% of the text. Uh, if uh, uh, we show only those identified as relevant, we may get below 20%. So there is definitely potential for summarization, but of course we need to test it in practice. Okay, so let me get to the conclusion and I hope really that uh, we will have a, a lively discussion about these topics. So I've shown to you two different avenues uh, for conversational RE. Uh, one is a, a pre-requirement specification traceability, and the second one is a tool for summarizing a conversation. Of course, one can find other avenues. Uh, one very interesting one is uh, whether we could be able to generate automatically requirements for the conversations. And this is a high-risk, uh, high-value research direction uh, the high risk uh, is because based on previous research that we conducted, uh, we see that in real world conversations, explicit requirements are not very often mentioned, only in 10% of the text. Uh, there are some researchers uh, uh, who started working at these topics, 
but this is still work in progress and I hope that in the future we'll see more results. Um, before I conclude, I'd like to make a very brief uh, note about evaluation metrics. Uh, and uh, for now, uh, we've been using standard metrics from information retrieval, such as precision, recall, and F1 score. Uh, but I think, especially with conversational RE tools that support the conversation as it goes, we should move toward quality use metrics. I'd like to see papers that report on the efficiency, on the satisfaction, on aspects that uh, are not just uh, uh, an estimation of the effectiveness, but they look how much look at uh, they measure how much the tool can support the analyst. So, uh, from my own perspective, the way ahead, uh, therefore, or at least uh, where I want to go, and I invite you to join uh, this uh, endeavor, is uh, to move from these tools that we have right now that operate mostly on the specification and they support the refinement process and move towards these conversational RE tools uh, that support the conversation as it unfolds. And it's, of course, more, much more challenging, but I think uh, there is potential to have an impact not only on research, but also on practice. This concludes my presentation. I thank you very much for listening and I'm very happy to take all the questions you may have.